You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life inspired by the ancient tradition of Stoic philosophy from Greece and Rome. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. This is episode 92, David Silverman on Injustice. Dave speaks about the injustice he sees from the political left, adding his personal experience recovering from hashtag MeToo allegations he argues are unsubstantiated. Dave also talks about guilt, the danger of groupthink, oppression, anger, and friendship. I've been meaning to record this episode for some time following Dave speaking out after months of silence. Initially, and still to this day, some see Dave as an abuser, but after reading his side of the story, complimented with testimony from others, I see no good reason to believe the accusations levied against Dave. David and I started to talk about the concept of justice, but the conversation went more into his personal story and insights reflecting on his time as president of American Atheists and chair of the 2012 Reason Rally. Dave was one of the most, if not the most, public-facing individuals challenging religion and advocating for church-state separation, with his brand of firebrand atheism, even appearing on Fox News, challenging Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly. Years ago, Dave and I butted heads. He was deep into social justice and feminism, but now the situation is quite different, as Dave has left the far left. He's apologized for his past behavior, and I'm happy to accept his apology. We chatted for more than an hour, but unfortunately, some audio was lost due to technical problems. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com for past episodes and social media links. Support my efforts through Patreon to receive special perks, including having upcoming podcast guests answer your questions, custom-made podcast episodes, and private one-on-one calls to discuss whatever you'd like. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com to learn how to make money, save money, and travel the world at next to no cost with credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. On to today's episode. For a deeper dive into some of the information presented on this episode, including Dave's side of the story, see the show notes. All right. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, Justin. Good to be back on the air with you. (laughs) Absolutely. A lot has changed since then. So uh, we'll talk today about this topic of justice. And first, we have the current pandemic. Uh, You were saying that you're sheltered in place, but construction continues outside. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because even when I I live in downtown Seattle, yeah, the construction outside my window has continued throughout most of this virus. So whatever they're doing out there, uh, apparently it's essential. And I'm looking at this world from the uh, from the outside now, as I guess we all are. And uh, watching the world change, it's a really scary and interesting thing to observe. Um, I I haven't gone to the gym, so I'm trying to keep in in shape. Uh, I I just got approved to adopt a dog. Yay. (laughs) Um, And so hopefully that dog will get me out of the house, out of the apartment. It's sad because I haven't seen my friends. I haven't seen, you know, the people I'm with. and, And it's, you know, I miss them. And everybody does. Um, I I would assume that it's affecting me the same way it's affecting everybody else, right? Um, Hoping that this thing, I'm dreading the second wave. I'm dreading this, I'm I'm dreading the early open leading to the second wave. Uh, Watching everybody argue, I'm watching this become political. You know, one (laughs) one of the things that's interesting is that um, coincident with the COVID-19 pandemic is I stopped, well, I, I disconnected my cable. I have just made this change to go from network news to YouTube news. Nice, nice. And so, yeah. I, I, it, I'm definitely on board with that. <laughs> it's, way, it's way better for anybody out there who's a news person. Uh, YouTube news is way better because you can pick the stories and you can hear both sides talk about the same story really easily. And then you can go and see the raw footage. So I've been able to really observe sitting at home doing very little. I have been able to really observe the spin on both sides. Definitely grateful for technology, staying at home, uh, keeping busy. This would be a a much different ordeal maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Right. Uh, Who knows what would have been 20 years ago. My goodness, (laughs) the internet would have been crazy. You know, it's interesting because um, I used to be so far left. I used to be so woke and so progressive. Did you know Rachel Maddow lies? (laughs) <laughs> no, she, does. Uh, she, she totally lies sometimes. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, Anderson Cooper, Tucker Carlson on Fox News, even though he's on Fox News, sometimes he says correct things. Yeah. So you're, you're getting information from all sides of the issue rather than just listening to one. And uh, it's a lot easier to, to see how this. And so this pandemic has just highlighted how much. I mean, I hate to say it, but fake news is a real thing. 
Mm-hmm. And it's on both sides. They all spin it. Yeah, I, th- I think a change for both of us, rather than just being in, in one camp, rather getting the ideas from all places and then coming to a decision and not being so wound up with one particular label of, oh, I'm on the left, I'm on the right, I'm in the center or whatever, just uh, rather getting information from all spaces. Yeah, I'm, I'm really tired of labels. I'm, I'm really tired of loyalty to a label. I, th- I think the left has uh, really, really disappointed me. I think uh, this whole sexual allegation thing against Biden um, has really incensed me. It's really made me angry because everybody is dismissing it. Everybody is saying, oh, Tara Reid is such a bad person. Yeah, so different different standards depending on the person. Wow, the folks. Wow. I mean, for crying out loud, she's got people that she told. She told contemporaries. Her mother went on Larry King. Her mothers don't go on Larry King if he made her feel a little uncomfortable, okay? Let's put believe all women in the trash now okay it happened to me three times to see it happen to me three times and as you and i were talking off uh, you know before it's not just that it happened to me three times it's that all three accusations were readily embraced by organized feminism one of the accusations is so ridiculous. I mean, it, you cannot see it. It's, she says that I touched her on the back at a party, uh, a party where she invited me to as a friend. I touched her on the back and she said that it connected to her vagina, the nerve in her back connected to her vagina and therefore it's sexual assault. It is an obvious setup. It's an obvious trap in my opinion. And if you look, you can see it. And the problem is not that there's one malevolence person did this to me the problem is all of feminism is embracing her the problem is not the individuals the problem is all of feminism is embracing all of these women oh you're so brave oh you're so courageous for coming out but when it comes to biden this woman who has whose mother was so upset by what happened that she went on larry king he gets a pass and i lost everything and he gets a pass And so now we need to put believe all women to bed. Now we need to admit that women can and do lie for about sexual assault for personal gain. Do we wish it wasn't true? Yes, we all do. Does it hurt women when they do? Yes, it does. Does it hurt women when we say that they do? Yeah, it may. So they better stop doing it because it's not my fault if they do a crime and we tell the truth. They got to stop doing this. Organized feminism needs to step up. It, it, it's, it's obviously lost its way here. They're just taking down people they want to take down. Me Too isn't a tool for them to pull themselves up. It's a weapon. And, and it, it's being used when they see fit. And when they don't see fit, a la Joe Biden. Yeah, it's, it's too bad as a movement that seemed to be with good intentions from the start. Everybody thought, okay, this is, there are these abusers. We're going to give a voice to people who didn't have it. We're going to try to correct some kind of injustice, but it turns out to be complicated, as you say. I, I, I was all into Me Too. I was so proud of it. I was happy about it because, of course, Justin, you have to understand, there's just so much impediment to a woman coming out and saying she's being sexually assaulted. And by the way, only 2% of rape allegations are false. And, and and by the way, everybody knows that women are so, that there's this girl code and they would never make it worse for other women by faking sexual assault. So we should just believe them all. I remember saying those words and they were wrong words. And I am sorry for saying those words. And I think other people should be sorry for saying those words. Those words were infantilizing words. Those words were not words that were based on data. They were not words that were based on good numbers. They were not words that were based on information. They were not words, frankly, based on respect for the female sex. They were words based on mantra. And nobody should be uttering them. I shouldn't have uttered them and I will never utter them again, except to show how mantra works. How you can put your your skepticism aside if society tells you to. And it's the poison that's messing with our society right now. On its face, believe all women is bullshit. On its face, the idea, the concept that no women could or would lie about sexual assault is bogus. But I believed it. So many people do. 
And because it, that's the whole mantras and group thing. One of the reasons that I'm, I'm doing all these podcasts is to try and just get my word out that we need to be welcoming to people who leave progressivism. I think progressivism is going to die and fade out in a big way now because the hypocrisy of Me Too, the hypocrisy of progressives saying, oh, we were always about due process. And so progressivism is now just gonna kind of ooze back into liberalism. And I'm, I hope that that's what's going to happen. I really want to see due process come back into vogue. I really want to see skepticism come back into vogue. Yeah, we'll see what comes out of it if people are willing to re-examine their beliefs. As you were saying, you've had some serious cognitive shifts, so maybe some others will reconsider their ideas as well. I hope so. I mean, it's hard because, I mean, it took, look what it took to shake me out of it. Even after I had my head bitten off, I still followed it for several months. I still supported it for several months. Wokeism is a religion and it infects the brain. And people are trying to do good. Everybody's trying to do good. Social justice is well intended. But the entire idea of implied rage, inferred rage, assumed rage, and this outrage based on mantra, the, the idea that that data is is uh, fungible, that, that knowledge is flexible, and that somebody can be something can be true for one person and not true for another person. So numbers don't really mean a thing. So truth doesn't really matter. So if I feel abused, I am abused and you're guilty. And once you once you go into that realm, once you go into the postmodern realm, you take that step, you lose your grip on reality. You lose reality, which is why I've lost so much faith in the atheist movement, for lack of a better word. Uh, right, right. So much for like reasonable person standard or evidence being presented for claims. It's yeah, more about feelings over the facts and the evidence, unfortunately. It's so disappointing to look at them from the outside, to look at these organizations, these once great organizations, these organizations that once upon a time stood for due process, stood for equality stood for separation of church and state and the elimination of lies and skepticism. They stood for skepticism and they've assumed skepticism. Skepticon. <laughs> Skepticon is named Skepticon, but there's no skepticism there anymore. It's all social justice. American atheists, their convention was going to be completely social justice. There wasn't going to be any ex-Muslims there. I haven't seen an ex-Muslim at an FFRF convention in a while. I'm not sure about that. AHA discontinued. This is Roy Speckhart. OK, a man I've known for decades. They discontinued their relationship with AAI when I was in charge because I was in charge, not because I had been found guilty, but because I had been found guilty by the kangaroo court and they couldn't stand up to the fact that social justice uh, issues civil liberties. And CFI, Robin Blumner, see, she's not talking to me either. These people don't care about the truth anymore. And I'm not the only barometer here. I shouldn't be the only barometer. I'm, I say this about this because it's my personal experience. But I, I mean, I look at these orgs, Secular Student Alliance is a joke. They're not doing anything anymore. The atheist movement and the individual orgs in the atheist movement should all have functions. They should all have individual functions where they add something new and different to the pie. When the atheist, when I was in charge of American atheists, American atheists stayed in its market segment. We were the hardliners. We were the edge to the sword. That's what we did. The firebrand atheists. That's right. And if you wanted a, if you wanted a huggy feely atheist, we would tell you go to AHA, go to CFI. <laughs> you know that's their stuff. And and and. We with, that was the right thing to do. And when we added, when we said like to a to an amicus brief, we would add to the amicus brief in a way to add to the conversation. We would do it in a way to say, OK, we don't just agree with this. We agree with this from a different perspective because we're hardline atheists. We think this we added to the conversation. That's what you're supposed to do in an activist organization. You bring progress, you make change, you add to it. And what I've seen from the atheist movement, what remains of the atheist movement, is that nobody's doing that anymore. They're all just saying, okay, we're social justice, we're LGBT, we're atheists and we love you. But they're not saying anything new. They're not adding anything. They're just jumping on a bad wagon and saying, yay, we won. Yay, we're fighting this fight. 
but we're not. And we're just cheerleaders now. And I look at them and I'm like, well, where are you adding value? What are you doing? American Atheist has $3 million in assets. What are you doing? Where are you adding value? I, I look at the Richard Dawkins Foundation. What is he doing? What is AHA doing? FFRF has good lawsuit. They're doing it right. Yeah, I see some activism from the Satanic Temple. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, we now, got a lot, a lot of really good stuff with that. That's a great point right there. The Satanic Temple is a great example of an organization adding to the conversation. They're doing lawsuits from a different perspective, and they're bringing the conversation forward. My bus ad lawsuit recently concluded as well with some help from the ACLU. So that was an issue I've worked with them on several years. So there was some success there. Oh, right. A lot of success there. Yeah. You, did you win? Yes. yes. To, to get atheist on the bus? It was just the it was just <laughs> atheist, right? You finally won yeah, that just, thing. Yeah, just the word atheist. Yep. <laughs> the minimalistic advertisement. See, that's... Yeah. I remember when you started that so long ago. Congratulations <laughs> on the win. Yes, thank you. It was a recent a recent victory. Yep. But yeah, that's activism. That's pushing a boundary. That's making a progress. What are what is the atheist movement doing now? Let, let me make some suggestions. I hope it gets political. I hope it starts talking about issues, not about pol not about not about the people, but about the issues. I hope it starts putting atheism in front of the candidates so that the candidates will actually talk about religion. I know everybody's going to be talking about COVID and everybody's going to talk about, talk about the economy. Try and get it in there. Try and get religion in there. Try and be seen. Bring in the ex-Muslims. Bring the ex-Muslims back. Focus on everybody and not push out everybody who's not progressive. Um, I don't know if you know this, Justin, but you can be an atheist and not be a progressive and still be a progressive. <laughs> And right, right. you can actually even be a Republican and be a good person and be an atheist. It's crazy, but it's true. Leftifying this progressivifying of the atheist movement, because I used to be a part of it. I used to be in it. And it took a lot to shake me out. It took a, a tremendous thing to shake me out. And so let's not make fun of them for being stuck in it. Let's not deride them for being stuck in it. Let's offer them a path, an open arm to say, hey, You've got to come back to the world of reality. Knowledge is real. Um, people have to work in order to do well. And sometimes you can be wrong. And, you know, the world isn't a terrible place just because you're a minority. We, we can do this. We don't need the outrage. Yeah. And indeed, I, I, going back to these movements or groups, I, I think that, yes, there were some good intentions to start with. And indeed, OK, there are some issues that certain groups of people face, all people face, mm -hmm. and maybe disproportionately in some cases. Sure. But to shame others, to assume that anyone who disagrees with you is evil and we need to shun certain people for no good reason. Right. That, that, that's been so common. And that, that was going back to like 2012. When you had Atheism Plus come on the stage and you had uh, popular bloggers announcing for certain people to be blacklisted and all kinds of purity tests that were going on back then. I remember. I remember when I was doing 2016, when I was doing the, uh, when I was on the Reason Rally team for 2016, I was the vice president of the Reason Rally then. And the, um, we had a very secret thing happening. We had Johnny Depp agreed to come to the reason rally and he was coming and he was confirmed and then the allegations from amber heard came out and everybody including myself turned on johnny depp it would have been so wonderful to have him but it also would have been terrible because everybody else also believed the allegations against him which have turned out to be completely false and made up it's hard because I was infected. I was a part of it. And I feel a lot of guilt for how I did for what I did to Mr. Depp. And I have publicly apologized for it. You know, I feel a lot of guilt. And at the same time, I feel a lot of anger for having been used and misused by this meme, by this this horrible meme of purity. But I mean, yeah, I, I remember, you know, we put in the sexual the sexual harassment policies at American Atheists. I was the first to do that. Um, I put up those big uh, sexual harassment policies and I stood by them. And to a certain degree, I still think they were a good idea. Kind of uh, extrapolated on that since then, you know, um, unwanted sexual, repeated unwanted sexual advances became unwanted sexual advances, uh, which was a little bit of a problem in, in future generations of that document. <sighs> Looking back on the blacklists and the purity tests, there were people I didn't put on that stage. I didn't want the uh, pushback, and I regret so much of that. 
And I hope that people stop doing that, but I'm, not, I'm sure they won't. It's going to be really interesting, though, Justin, because I don't know how this atheist movement is going to survive moving forward. I really don't. The way I see it, these these, these organizations made income through conventions and through um, memberships, donations. I think the donations were spurred on, the memberships were spurred on because of urgency. I think urgency was spurred on because of the, the the reason that you do those those marginal returns the reason you do something different you add the value is to get the membership because if you're not adding value the membership will see it and it will go somewhere else if you're saying oh we did it too and that's all you're doing the membership will go somewhere else conventions are very profitable if you have size the conventions that I used to run were somewhere between, you know, 800 and 1,200 people. The last convention that we had in Oklahoma City, we had 850 people, and the headliner was Hugh Laurie. And yeah, and it was great, and that's that's the way it was working. But in order to do that, you have to have economies of scale. You have to have the volume of people. You get the volume of people, you get the room nights, you get everything for free. So you have to have a volume of people in order to have a profitable convention. Now, this last convention, their 2019 convention, they said they had 850 people. They had somewhere around 300 people. Their convention, I have no idea how many tickets that they were sold, but they weren't publicizing it at all. They had a lousy lineup. It was really uninteresting. Nobody was talking about it. There was no buzz. It was going to be another very small convention, even smaller than last year, probably. And I'm going to speculate that the same thing is happening at AHA and I don't know about FFRF because they still they they still have a valid business model. My point is that I don't know how these orgs are going to survive long term anymore. Uh, I don't think CFI is uh, making enough money. I'm sure. Well, I'm not sure, but I'm very confident SSA is not. And I'm looking at the mo- and I'm looking at the movements and I'm saying, all right, well, if these conventions aren't going to be motivational, if they're going to be SJW conventions, they're going to be like Skepticon. I. I I've heard that Skepticon, the last Skepticon was somewhere around 100 people, and they and they used to be 1,200 people. Yeah, and it was free admission too, right? Yeah, it's free admission, and um, it's supposed to have been, you know, once upon a time it was a great convention, but now it's all social justice. It's a nothing event. It's an unprofitable event where people just get together and say, yay, we're together. But now, if all they're doing is saying, yay, we're together, and everybody's afraid of the virus— uh, that's going to be an additional thing. And oh, by the way, there's a lot more important issues now because nobody is adding any value. Um, so there's no important issues because you're not adding any value. I have serious doubts about this current incarnation, incarnation of the atheist movement. Now, there are other organizations in the atheist movement that are coming up. We've got uh, Atheist Republic, uh, International Association of Atheists, Atheists for Liberty. Uh, these organizations are doing well and they're targeting well, they're they're looking at the actual things that they want to do. Atheists for Liberty is going after conservative atheists and, and and centrist atheists. Yeah, libertarians, people who aren't so identifying at the left. It's huge. It's a huge market. It's completely untapped. And it's completely untapped because of the utter incompetency of the leadership of the current atheist movement. There's millions of people there, and it's completely untapped. They're thirsting for support, and they're completely completely ignored due to, I'll say it again, the incompetency of the current management of the atheist movement, letting them drift, leaving them to be so that you could raise your hand and say, yay, we're part of the crowd too. A lot of distrust and a lot of vitriolic language toward Republicans and people who aren't so on the left, right? Even when Edwin Rogers was selected as the, what, the CEO, the executive director of Secular Coalition for America, there were people who were saying, oh, we don't want a Republican in charge. What are you talking about? Right. She shouldn't be there. And I supported her. I supported her at that point because I thought we needed a Republican. We did need a Republican. We do need the Republicans. Yeah. How about some diversity, right? That's what diversity <laughs> you is. You hear that. Diversity <laughs> Ideological not, diversity. Diversity is not, I have a black person and a brown person and a male person and a female person, and we all agree. That's not diversity. Diversity is, I got a person who thinks this way and a person who thinks that way. And that brown person brings a different perspective. That's his value add. That's why diversity adds value. That yellow person brings a different perspective. That gay person brings a different perspective we all disagree but we come to a consensus that is the value of diversity that it's about diversity of thought not echo chambers and so when you've got atheist organizations and all they do is say look we've got diversity cut down we've got all the people of color in the world 
except, of course, for anybody who's not progressive. Right, right. Yeah, many on the right will criticize the atheist movement and think that all atheists are left-leaning, atheists are communists, this or that, right? And right. if you could look at it and see, oh, well, look, uh, PZ Myers is uh, saying this about Atheists for Liberty, right? Atheists for Liberty made their announcement and saying they're about Enlightenment values. And his response is, oh, colonialism and slavery and racism oh, and homophobia? Jesus. Uh, come on. Wow. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I thought we were about Enlightenment values. Like, wasn't that the whole thing of the atheist and skeptic community? Yeah. <laughs> You know, PZ, he's he's another former friend. Uh, I've just got so many of them, but I, I, I look at them all in the rearview mirror now. I used to be so happy to be PZ's friend. I used to really relish his friendship. I, I don't think a lot of people do. I have seen the true face of a lot of people in this movement. I think we all have. I, I saw my true face, and I tried to pull it back and, and, and make it a truer face, and I hope they do. I mean, when you can't live in a space where you say, enlightenment values include skepticism. Just dismiss <laughs> skepticism. Yeah, it's the most uncharitable interpretation <laughs> ever. It, it, it's, it's not even worth it. This is not effort. This is like watching Fox News and or MSNBC and seeing them live for personal gain. This is yeah. it's not worth it to engage. Right. Yeah, I was idealistic back in the like 2011 or so when I, I, I saw a lot of this going on online and I tried to reason. I tried to have the discussion. They didn't want to debate. They would just ban. They would just uh, name calling, just making up all this yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Right. I, I was I was engaged in a lot of local activism at the time and people. Z Myers was talking about me on his blog and uh, bloggers were linking my fundraisers and talking about, oh, look, he's doing these debates. He's challenging city council. He's doing this. He's doing that. And then it seemed like overnight they just completely turned on. Yeah, it was like the reason rally. Uh, Greta Christina mentioned me and my efforts on stage. Yeah. And then like a week later, it was like, oh, we don't want him at all. He's terrible. You know, we can't do this. Uh, nope, not anymore. You know, Greta Christina, and, and I'll just go into this. Because Greta Christina used to be my friend, and I wanted her voice to speak. I socialized again with Greta. I socialized with her wife, with her and her wife Ingrid. Thought they were great people. We were together. Greta Christina dumped me as a friend without hearing my side, blocked me, and would not talk to me. That's what mm -hmm. Greta Christina did because she was my friend. Because I know she's smart. Yeah, and you've put your side of the story quite public, your website, firebrandforgood.com, right? And many people can look at all of that evidence and say, okay, here's his side of the story, here's what she has to say, rather than just, okay, there's an allegation, because that's how a lot of these things go. People go to social media, and rather than looking into things, rather than, okay, we're going to file a police report, and we're going to see what happened here, they just, like, oh, we're on our side, yeah. you know, another another evil man, right? It's it's the typical yeah. theme, unfortunately. So there's there's no appeals process. And no, I'm not saying this because I want to be Greta Christina's friend. She's proven to be a lousy friend. I want everybody to know that she's a lousy friend and what she did because people should judge her based on her lousy friendship. You know, people mention her a lot. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. I want to add to that and make sure that people know. You've talked on your website about consensual encounters. And even when there was a concern about like, OK, that's enough. Like, OK, I'm going to leave or whatever. It's like, OK, it's not like you were holding someone against their will or continuing to do things that people uh, said not to do. Right. Dude, I'm a peaceful man. <laughs> I don't hurt people. If you want to go, you go. That's not what happened. The only time that she went, she left, of course, when she wanted to leave. And then she came back for more. Oh, she didn't mm -hmm. tell me that, but she came back for more. She came back to my apartment and then she said it was non-consensual. Have there been people from the feminists or social justice side who've come out and said, you know, hey, I'm sorry or I've changed my mind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some people have and uh, actually quite a few of them have. Some of my best friends today have, have done that because it's obvious. I'm actually quite happy that the people who haven't haven't i mean there's a bunch of people greta yvette i'm i'm done with fair weather friends i'm done with fake friends i'm done with friends who use me and that's what was going on you know i was looking at uh, yvette ross is another one I, I did her a lot of favors i put her up on stage gave her boosts and she dropped me i am so happy to be done with fair weather using friends i don't want them in my life anymore quality of the people that I have in my life right now 
are leaps and bounds better than the people that I had in my life before. The friends that I have right now are friends. They're not looking for anything from me. They came to me and stayed through me through a very dark time. It's not just a fr- it's not just a friend who 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 will be with me well, through good times. These friends were either with me through the dark time or came to me during the dark time. I owe my life to them. I am clearly emerging from the depression. I'm clearly emerging from and looking forward to the future. I've got a new job. I've got a new career. Um, I've got new activism. It's it's very hard for me to put it down because of the level of injustice and the level of pain. But I am moving forward. And as I am doing this, I am stronger now than I used to be. I mean, I used to say that someday I'll be stronger than I was. And I believe I've achieved achieved that point. Nice. I, I, I'm injured, but I am stronger. I am more powerful now. And a part of that is that I've got a support system around me, a support network around me of intelligent, powerful, kind people who um, care about improving the world and care about each other. And we all care about each other. I've got several, several deep, meaningful friendships now with wonderful people. And I can't tell you how much I love them and appreciate them. The world has changed since you and I were on the podcast last. Yeah, that was around like 2012 or 2013. Yeah. We were, uh, yeah, that <laughs> so went over so well. That, that podcast <laughs> when you were completely right and I was completely wrong and yelled at you unjustly. Yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> this one's going better so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, it, it's it's a thing. Even uh, there was Jamie Kilstein. It was someone uh, who was very critical in the past. He also caught an allegation. He went on the Joe Rogan show and yeah. was talking about how he was wrong about that. So yeah. that's, that's a good thing. If people can and he, publicly admit that instead of double doubling down instead of just ignoring it. I think that's a laudable thing. Yeah. Kilstein is one of the people who reached out to me. Kilstein is one of the people who came, who came out, who came back. It's interesting because we are, it it is like a religion. This wokeism is like a religion. And I do feel like I was in it. I do feel like the cognitive dissonance that was really, really enveloping me is very, very religion-like. I mean, the only difference between wokeism and religion is that there's no deity involved. But here's the thing. There's no deity. And that and, and in all the religions, deities are the good guys. The gods are always the good guys. Right. And if there's no God, there's no good guy. And that's why I think wokeism has no mercy, forgiveness or redemption, because there's no good character. I mean, say what you want about the gods of the Bible and everything, they're supposed to be the good guys. When you talk to the believers, the believers say, oh, our God is about love and caring and merciful and, and Allah is merciful and, 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 and all that stuff. And there is none of that in the religion of wokeism. There's this huge outrage on behalf of other people that is fueled by mantra, that is fueled by non-data, it's fueled by rumor. There's no fact checking because facts are not important anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no vehicle at all. There's no method. There's no interest in mercy, forgiveness or redemption because it's all about outrage on behalf of other people. Okay, that's that's the thing about wokeism. It's not help. I'm being oppressed. It's help. He's being oppressed. She's being oppressed. They're being oppressed. And so if you're fighting on behalf of other people, you can't forgive on behalf of other people. You can't say, oh, they feel better now. So you can't go to the white, you can't go to Dave Silverman. If you're a wokist and you look at all the data and you come to the conclusion that I'm innocent, you face a tremendous battle if you say it. You can't say it. Right. right. You can't say it. You'll You'll, uh... You'll be ousted immediately. You'll be, you'll oh, be, yeah. you're, you're a, 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 a Dave Silverman sympathizer, uh, you know, or whatever. <laughs> a gender traitor, a parroting misogynistic thought. Yes, or, yes, yes. Or, I'm know, a victim of the patriarchy or whatever. Oh my goodness, the, the patriarchy. And this culture of fear and this culture of ignorance that has enveloped progressive, liber- progressive leftism and the atheist movement. And, and, and that's why this, well, that's why I fear. And that's why I fight. That's why I'm that, that's my next place. It's, it's not about it's not about Ten Commandments on public lawns anymore for me. It's about freedom of speech. It's about the concept of truth. It's about the concept of due process, learning, 
educating, finding out what's real and working with it. It's a concept of humanism, which means not letting your ego get in the way of the common good, not letting your hurt feelings get in the way of somebody else's health or well-being, even if that person is a cishet white guy. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's crazy. I, I read um, White Fragility uh, by, what's her name, Robin DiAngelo. That's the whole Bible for the whole all whites are racist thing. You read this and you realize if all whites are racist and only whites are racist, then everything anti-racism becomes anti-white. That's actually literally what happens. You call it anti-racism, but you're talking about every white person and only every white person when you talk about racist in those contexts, when you change the definitions. Yeah, they're talking about power, power and privilege. Yeah. Right. That's what they're that's what they're talking. They want to make victims and they, they want to protect themselves from from the same criticism. Oh, I can't be racist. I'm black. No, you can be. You can. You, and when you can't be racist because you're black, think about the black. Think about racism in the black community when it's actually sanctioned. Well, that's going to create a tremendous amount of of noise if every white person is racist and only white people are racist. Think of the next step there. Think of the kids being raised in that mentality. Think of the people like me, the Gen X white guys who fought hard to get rid of racism in the workforce. We fought hard to, to lift the glass ceiling. We're the good guy, white guys, and now we're all racists and bad guys. Think of what this is doing. Think of how this is, and it's all based on ignorance, zero numbers. Zero Mm -hmm. numbers. Nobody is saying a black person is X less likely to succeed because of all of this racism in this in this area. Nobody is saying here is the racism. Nobody is saying here is the racism. Here is the misogyny. Nobody is saying here is the problem. They're just looking at the outcomes and saying, oh, all those outcome deficiencies are 100 percent racism and misogyny because all people are equal. All people are equal, of course, because there is no truth anymore. And I can just say all people are equal and that becomes truth. They, they just make it a really simplified issue, even with things like the gender wage gap. There's this talk of, oh, women make 85 cents on a dollar compared to men. And they're amounting that to sexism, misogyny, whatever else. But if you're isolating for particular variables and looking at the issue more deeply and are controlling for certain variables, you see that even in their own documents. You can see their statistics from, what was it, the UAW, the University of American Women. You can see that that goes down to pretty much nothing. Yeah. But yeah. the talking point is oppression. The talking point is women are being held back. By right? men. By men. Yeah. The talking point is men bad. And, and this is a great example, Justin, because I remember, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 53. Yeah, 31. Okay, so when I was young, in the 19, early 70s, when the original Batman was still on the air, there was a commercial with Batgirl, and it was for the Equal Rights Amendment. And I remember this commercial very well because not only did I agree with it at whatever age I was at the time, I was a child, because they played it over and over and over again. So I actually have the, the commercial memorized. It's one of the <laughs> things in my brain from childhood. And Batgirl said... And I quote, same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. That was what we were fighting for. And that's what I fought for. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. That is equality. And when you use that number, when you use that method, the pay gap, the gender pay gap is two cents, two cents. And that two cents could be partially because they don't negotiate well, Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. See the show notes for more information surrounding topics discussed in this episode. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com for past episodes and social media links. Support my efforts through Patreon to receive special perks. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com to learn how to save money, make money, and travel the world at next to no cost through credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. Podcast music, Used with permission is brought to you by Phil Giordana's symphonic metal group Fairyland from their album Score to New Beginning. John Bartman offered free consultation and audio edits for episodes 51 through 63. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who support my work. Have a great day.